Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. So for tonight's discussion, we wanted to give a little bit of advanced notification before we get to today's subject. And this is this is a heavier conversation. And so today we're going to talk about Apple and some of the conversations around the detections they're proposing to implement to detect child sexual abuse material. And we understand this is a conversation that could be triggering for people that have had averse events in childhood or adulthood or know someone who has. And our, our promise to you is that we're going to handle this conversation in a way that is as professional as possible, as factual as possible, and is really focused on the technology more than anything, because that's what we know. And that's what we are most comfortable talking about. But by virtue of this conversation, it does involve a little bit of people who might engage in trading or soliciting that material, uh, law enforcement and technology's role in, in aiding and bringing people who would attempt to traffic in those materials to justice. So again, this will be a technically focused, factually focused conversation, but if this is something that's, that's hard for you to listen to, we certainly want to be understanding and empathetic of that. And if, if it's something where you just can't join us this week, we hope to catch you next week, but just wanted to kind of provide a notification up front before we get into tonight's conversation. In the news today, it was reported that Apple delayed its plans to roll out its child sexual abuse detection technology. And basically, they were citing feedback from customers and privacy policy groups. The technology is called CSAM, and it was announced last month as a new feature in iOS 15. And I'm surprised that Apple wasn't prepared for the feedback, but it was mostly negative. The Electronic Frontier Foundation, or the EFF, had amassed more than 25,000 signatures from consumers, and there were more than 100 policy and rights groups, including the ACLU, that called on Apple to abandon their plans. So why the outrage? I think tonight we're going to explore why people are so mad because let's be upfront, we all agree that trafficking this type of material is terrible and horrific and it should be detected and the people who are trafficking this type of material should be brought to justice. But before we talk about how the technology is implemented, let's just go back a little bit in time and go on the history of how electronic companies and tech giants have tracked this going all the way back to 2009. So Microsoft actually with Dartmouth College had developed a technology that was going to help identify these type of images. And they shared that technology with other tech giants at the time, including the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children. And that technology is called photo DNA. And as soon as they developed it, they installed it on Bing, OneDrive, Outlook.com, and then later on shared it with Facebook and Gmail. And what it is, is an image matching technology. And they create a unique fingerprint, or very commonly known now as a hash, that can be compared to other images so that if you have copies of that image, same hash, then we know that you have a copy of the exploited material. And Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Dropbox, they have been scanning this content in their users, OneDrive, Dropbox, Gmail, Facebook, all that stuff. They've been scanning it for over a decade now. And why is it, Adam, that Apple was so behind and that they're pushing for it now? 
So before we get into that, I just want to add a little color to everything you've laid out so far. So the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, you'll commonly hear that referred to as NICMEC, uh, is funded by the United States federal government. And it is the only entity that is legally permitted to store copies of this child sexual abuse material, which I think we'll refer to as CSAM moving forward, because that's honestly easier to say. Um, and NICMAC creates these hashes, these fingerprints. And, and we all know as technologists of this show that a hash is a technical concept. It's a mathematical concept where something can only generate a specific hash. Like every time it runs through that algorithm, it will spit out the same hash, but that hash, which is just a collection of letters and numbers cannot be turned back into the original content. So if I have a fingerprint of something that is CSAM, I cannot turn that back into the original image. It doesn't work that way. So when companies like Microsoft, Facebook, Dropbox, Google are scanning for this material on their servers, they don't themselves possess that material to do the scan or the comparison against. They only have the hashes. And it's important to also understand with hashes like, let's say Andy and I were taking pictures of his car and Andy took a picture of his car and I took a picture of his car from a different angle. My hash of his car will never match the hash that he took of his picture. They will never generate the same hash. That's not how it works. But there's concepts in here. And again, th this gets a little more complicated where if that photo that Andy took was cropped or, or used a different portion of the image, it could still generate that same fingerprint because ultimately the content is still there. So that's another concept to understand is that when we talk about matching hashes and, and these different organizations that are doing that, because I think there's going to be a, a, you know, a common outcry of, if I'm taking pictures of my kids being cute in the bathtub or something, what's the chance that that will match a hash of some of this material in NCMEX database? And the potential of that is one in a trillion. It's, it's impossible. It's no more likely than a picture of a sunset matching that same material. So I, I just want to kind of preface all this discussion with some of that background because I think it's really important to understand. So now going back to your point, Andy, that you had kind of handed it to me on, these other tech giants have been doing this kind of scanning for a long time. And in the New York Times report that was talking about this, there was a number thrown out from that obviously came from a source at Apple. It was, I don't think there was anybody on the record, but it was published by the New York Times. So obviously it's, it's most likely true that Apple had reported 265 cases of CCM in their servers. That's not, thousand, that's not million, 265 versus these other tech giants. I mean, the numbers are staggering, you know, 546,000 from Google, 144,000 from Snapchat, 96,000 from Microsoft, on and on and on and on. Why is Apple's number so much lower? Well, Apple has really made privacy a centerpiece of ev all of their conversation around all of their products. And I think they not only see it both as something I, I think they genuinely believe in from a leadership perspective. And I say that because I think Microsoft is a similar, very strong commitment to privacy as a fundamental human right, but Apple has architected a lot of their systems in a way that they do not have visibility into this data the way like Facebook does. If you upload a picture to Facebook, obviously Facebook can read the picture. They could make a hash of the picture. They can compare that against other hashes because of course they can. I mean, they have access to everything you upload. Apple has this tendency to design their systems in a way that they can't do it even if they wanted to. And so, or, or they just, they routinely don't. So what has happened is material that is stored even on Apple servers, like in this case, iCloud photo library, um, Apple theoretically does have access to the encryption keys to that, but they just, fundamentally do not want to scan that content. Or in the case of iMessage, Apple literally does not have access to that content. It's end to end encrypted. They don't have visibility into that. So I think it's important to put into context that Apple in some ways has, has kind of created this of their own accord with, with the hyper focus on privacy, which Andy and I are big fans of. We're not saying this like it's a bad thing, but when you're trying to do this kind of activity, they're, they're, architecture 
handcuffs them from being able to do a lot of this. And so I think that's where this whole conversation comes from is it's important to understand that because of, of Apple's stated commitment to privacy, because of using privacy as a differentiator for the organization, um, they, they just haven't had the opportunity to have these kind of reports that these other um, organizations have. I'd be willing to bet those 265 reports from Apple. The only thing I could think about where they would routinely have access to unencrypted data that, that they could you know, scan would be like email, like through their iCloud service or what used to be mobile me. Um, they do offer email, which I don't think a lot of people use, but it is there. And I, and you know, it's just like IMAP. So it's not like super secure or anything. I would be willing to bet that if CSAM flows in or out of iCloud mail, that is something Apple is scanning today. And that's probably where these 265 reports come from, from people dumb enough to traffic CSAM through mail. Uh, which is email, which is a kind of a crazy thought, but I think that gives kind of the context and background as far as um, why Apple has been so behind in, in, in the volume of reports compared to other tech giants and, and why I think they felt like it, it was time to do something because they clearly believe they have a trove of CSAM sitting in iCloud photo library and they're not seeing it. They're they're kind of turning a blind eye to it. And again, the story is deeper than that. Um, but I think that's where this came from is they're trying to find a way to do it in a way that respects all of their privacy goals and, and focus. Um, and, and maybe they just missed the mark a little bit here, but we'll, we'll kind of unpack that as we go along. Yeah, right on Adam. I think the privacy features and then knowing that they are trafficking this material just kind of broke the dam, so to speak, and they had to do something. And so let's talk about how CSAM works, because we know that the other tech giants, they're just scanning the libraries that are uploaded. And by virtue of their privacy stance, Apple just does not want to scan the iCloud library, even though they can, right? They can do that, but they want to design a whole new system which is what they designed here and they're rolling out and people are mad about it so if you have iCloud photo library switched on which means you're loading your photos to the cloud the idea is that Apple is going to start detecting for CSAM material in there the main difference on how they designed it was they're grabbing the known hashes from NCMEC and other organizations, and then they're applying a proprietary set of transformations on top of the known hashes, and then they're storing that rehashed value on the device, on your iOS device, the iPhone and the iPad. Now, that doesn't mean that they're storing the CSAM photos or the images. It is a value that when referred back or compared to their database will trigger and say this is CSAM material. And it's not even the hashes themselves. It's a rehash. They, they run it through an encryption, which cannot even be attributed back to the, the known hashes. But the main thing is it's on your phone. And so when you upload an image to iCloud and only when you upload an image to iCloud, Apple creates an image, a hash for that image as well. And Apple developed their own proprietary method of hashing, which is called neural hash. And it's similar to Microsoft's photo DNA, which everyone has been using for again over a decade 2009 so apple developed their own technique of fingerprinting photos into icloud and to put out there as well apple nor microsoft document or share the way that neural hash or photo dna works because they don't want anyone to try to reverse engineer that and defeat it. But 
The main idea is that Apple isn't actually scanning your photos. They're not using any type of content detection or optical scanning or computer vision or anything like that to look at the photo itself. They can't tell what you upload. They don't want to know what the image is. The neural hash is a math-based value of that image, and it's convoluted because, again, they run it through a proprietary tumbler, essentially, to encrypt, so to speak, that value. And then they embed that into the their database. And, of course, that is compared to their database and if it matches some sort of value then it will trigger a CSAM detection the other point is is that there can be false positives and so they do there has to be a number of uh, threshold so to speak before the actual CSAM warning gets triggered and When that happens, there's someone who actually will verify it because it's not a human who it's not, it's a machine that's doing all these comparisons. But when it triggers the actual CSAM detection, there will be an Apple employee or someone who actually reviews the images at that point to see if it's actually CSAM. So yeah, everything you said, that's a really good summary. Um, the, I think the threshold matching part is important where even in the case of one or two or three false positives here, which again are like one in a billion, one in a trillion type events, but are theoretically possible, that still would not trigger the system until you reach some sort of threshold. And it's not just, and again, to be clear, like we're going to differentiate what is Apple policy versus like what is mathematically not possible. And this is the latter until your device has flagged so many as matching the CSAM database from NCMEC, Apple cannot do an investigation because they don't have enough cryptographic data to reassemble it and make it meaningful. So there is a mathematic threshold there. There has to be X number of reports. And by the way, this has not been shared publicly. So we don't know if it's 10 or 20 or five or whatever, but there's some threshold where it is, it is, Again, mathematically not possible to even begin an investigation until that happens. Now, when investigation begins, initially it will be an Apple employee doing it. And there is an extremely low resolution version of the image that would then become accessible to that Apple employee when performing this investigation. Now, again, if, if, you know, you're a lottery winner here and, and you won Powerball. And uh, by the way, you've also managed to to trick this system and your photo of a sunset was inadvertently marked as being CSAM. Well, then the Apple employee will note that and be able to to handle that um, and, and mark that as a false positive then just by based on that low resolution version of the image. So again, like the threshold between how many things have to happen before this actually gets referred to law enforcement is a great number. You have to meet that threshold. An Apple employee does a manual review. If that passes the manual review, then and only then does this become a referral to law enforcement. Um, So just want to kind of point that out in adding some color to everything you've mentioned so far, Andy. This client side scanning of things is not new to Apple. And they do this because of their privacy stance. They don't want to scan anything on their servers. They really don't want to know what we as users have in their servers. And so that's why they kind of engineered this whole convoluted, let's take the hashes from Nick Mac and then we'll rehash them and then we'll scan them and come up with this whole algorithm of threshold and all of that. But to be clear, they're doing this client side stuff already because if it stays on the client, it means it's private. It's, it's private to us. So they do that for like photo search. If you're doing face recognition, subject identification, enhancements, and all of that actually requires scanning of the photo, not just hashes, but 
literally scanning of the photo and they've been doing that for a long time and that's how live text works that's how siri voice to text work because none of that gets transmitted to apple and everyone's been pretty happy with that for the most part because it doesn't violate our privacy we like it however the uproar was with this csam detection was that even though it was just hash matching and not scanning when it gets uploaded to the cloud, it felt like it was a violation to some people. And that detection wasn't being done for the user. It was for the exploited and abused children. But the results aren't ever returned to the user. So if I get a CSAM detection, Apple's not going to tell me that there was a false positive. They, they will tell you if you have a, an actual detection and you can dispute that if it's not real, but they're not going to tell you about the false positives. And they're sent to Apple and they can be forwarded to NCMEC and as well as law enforcement. So a lot of people felt that this was a violation of their privacy. And while other people and other companies are doing this in their cloud, I think some users felt that they've already consented to that. Like if it's on OneDrive or if it's on Dropbox, like it's not really theirs. But if you have it on the device for some reason, I think people felt like it was much more personal. Even though, like people forget, right? We license these devices and the OS comes from Apple. Like, we don't own anything on the device. The OS is licensed. The content that we put on there, even the music that you listen to can be taken away. I mean, it's it's all just kind of magic on the back end. And we think it's ours, but it really isn't. But, you know, again, perception, right? And Apple's built this reputation of privacy and all that. And so that's where it really hurt them uh, in this case. It it is a very interesting case because Apple has been criticized for this on-device stance as making their implementations inferior to like Google Photos, where you upload all your photos to Google Photos, Google does all the processing server side. If their computer vision technology gets better over time, that happens automatically. Google might kick off a rescan and your detection gets better than ever. You can go to Google Photos and type in dog and get all the dog pictures in your library. By the way, you can do the same thing in your iPhone and it actually works pretty well. But this is where Apple has actually been picked on as like they're they're kind of being like very on premises in a cloud world kind of analogy. And it's funny how now all of a sudden with this specific particular use case, I think there's been some pushback. So a couple of thoughts here. The, when Apple announced this, they announced a suite of products. They announced, or not products, products the wrong word, but a suite of solutions that are kind of related in, in that they all have some of the same goals in mind of protecting children. However, the, the implementation details and, and who they are for are actually very, very different. So one of the other things we're going to talk about in a little bit is this communication safety system for, for children on your um, your Apple family account, essentially. But before we talk about that, because it's so fundamentally different, I want to stay on this and talk about the slippery slope. Because I think, and Andy, I think you agree with me here, that everything we've talked about so far, like you hear kind of all this, and sure, there might be some grousing from you know, security researchers that they haven't been given, you know, the source code here, haven't been able to investigate it. Um, you know, kind of some of the typical complaints as you work with Apple, but I think Apple has actually earned some goodwill in terms of their commitment to privacy. Clearly they're extremely good at security and cryptography. I mean, they kept the FBI out, right? So I, I think Apple has some benefit of the doubt. Like from a technical perspective, I think this system is technically sound. I think this is really good. But I think where the concern comes in, and I think rightfully so, is that concept of scope creep, is that concept of slippery slope. And here's why. Apple has made the reverse argument before. Apple argued vociferously and most of the tech community came to their defense that if Apple were forced to build 
government back doors into iOS. Let's say, and here's the example I've always given. Okay. You know, you, you believe like law enforcement, like the FBI should have had a back door into the San Bernardino shooters iPhone. Um, so they could do an investigation there and Apple should have built that for them. What is to stop Apple then? If, if they give these backdoor keys or whatever to the United States government, what are they supposed to say when China comes and asks for the same thing? What are they supposed to say when India comes and asks for the same thing? That was always the argument at the time. And, and Apple made it was that the only safe play, the only safe move is not to play, you know, like war games. Um, the only safe move is to not develop that FBI OS version with that back door. If the back door never exists, then there can never be a slippery slope as to who has access to it. And I think that is the fundamental problem with this system is that same concept that Apple argued against before and is now arguing in favor of is that it is plain to see that if you inv have invented this really good system, this strong cryptographically sound privacy focused system to detect hashes of images, it doesn't matter what those image hashes ultimately are. What if they're uh, images that are deemed offensive to the um, Chinese Communist Party? What if they're images that are deemed offensive to the Russian Federation government? Um, on and on and on and on. You know, There's countless examples where you can think of a, a government would use this to the detriment of, of people around the world. And the technology then already exists where Apple would be forced to make really hard choices. Do you not want to sell your iPhones in China? Um, or do you want to let the Chinese Communist Party use this as a tool to go find um, you know, political adversaries and and highlight them? I mean, there's and Andy, I want to hear your your thoughts on slippery slope, but to me that's the real concern. I don't think most people, most reasonable people, have concern about the tech. I think the concern is the slippery slope. And I think the place that comes from is that Apple has been in this position and made the opposite argument. So this seems disingenuous here in that that's the case. And however, however, I guess there's that model of scanning server side and we tend to trust that and that would have the same implications. So, I mean, this stuff is just complicated. I want to hear your thoughts. I think they should have just done the server side scanning personally. And while that would have also made some headlines because it goes back on Apple's privacy promise to their users, I think scanning for those type of images server side is the norm. It's the industry norm. And I think it would have blown over pretty quickly, right? No one, no one wants that stuff floating around. And if you need to scan my things for known hashes, right? We're not talking about some convoluted uh, photo scanning or computer vision or anything like that. If you're talking about known hashes, and I know, and you know that the hashes have to match known images, then sure, you can scan my photos. That's fine. You're just scanning them for a hash. It should take pretty quick. And if it matches or if it doesn't match, I mean, like, that should be pretty quick. So uh, I I think they should have done that. And for sure, when you're doing it client-side and you're doing it with this proprietary system where you're rehashing the hashes, I mean, you could essentially, like you said, if the Russian government or the Chinese government had a photo or a document that is known that is flying around, they're like, yeah, we want to make sure none of our citizens have this on their phones. Well, they can force Apple to get the hash of that, then run it through their proprietary system. Then look in their iCloud drive or photos of, of that particular document or whatever it is and so yeah i think the slippery slope is is the the biggest danger here and you know we have already seen kind of that slippery slope in action because one of the technologies that was built to scan and hash this child sexual abuse imagery was repurposed to create a database of terrorist content 
that companies can contribute and access for the purpose of banning such content. And that database is managed by the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism. And it has almost no external oversight. And it's impossible to know what's even in that database. And there are things that are routinely flagged as terrorism and counter speech or repressive art or satire and stuff like that. And so we've already seen the technology being repurposed for other things that we have deemed not good for society, right? Terrorism is not good. I think we all agree to that, but what constitute terrorism? So that's the slippery slope is definitely has been demonstrated in the past as something that will happen. And so I think if you just keep it simple, scan the iCloud iPhoto libraries, there's going to be an uproar for sure, but it's clean. It's simple. You're just scanning for the hashes of the bad stuff. We know that. Okay, go for it. Yeah, I agree. I I, I agree with everything you said. So, um, you know, I... There's some interesting technical conversation too around kind of where Apple sits in this encrypted world. And we've done some of this in the past where we talked about iMessage being end to end encrypted, but your iCloud backups really aren't. So if you do iMessage in the cloud or, or whatever, um, then you're still at risk unless you completely turn all that off. And by the way, that fits in here too. If you don't want any of this scanning to happen, um, you can turn off iCloud photo library and it won't happen. This only happens for photos that are uploaded to iCloud photo library. So if you want to keep all your photos local on your device and not opt into this as you know a condition of service, you can do that. So it is possible for end users to disable this scanning, but then you're not a you know you're not entitled to using iCloud photo library essentially. Which, you know, everything we've talked about ultimately, I do think that's a that's worth pointing out is that Apple is basically making this like the the bar to admission. If you want your photo to be on our service, we're going to scan it against known um, bad content before we allow it to go up. And so that that is, by the way, the opt-out methodology here for what it's worth. There's also some speculation that this technology was created so that possibly in the future, Apple would encrypt iCloud. Because if you do encrypt iCloud, then you can't scan it. Mm-hmm unless you decrypt it first if they have the keys. But let's say they do an end-to-end encryption like they do with iMessage, and you can't read the content of that. Well, then you do want to have some sort of method to detect the bad stuff, which is the client-side scanning, before it gets uploaded. Mm -hmm. So there's some speculation that that also may be coming. Yeah, I agree. And, and, you know, there's... I think it was reported, actually, by a, a legitimate news agency. It might have been Reuters might have been the Washington Post. I don't remember who it was uh, that Apple actually had some sort of like gentleman's agreement with the major law enforcement agencies in the United States to not move forward with plans for full end to end encryption on all iCloud services um, for the purpose that as the trade off of like keeping the encryption strong on the local device. So I don't think that's ever obviously been confirmed or denied by anyone, but it was reported by a a reputable news gathering organization that there was some sort of gentleman's agreement in exchange for keeping the, the actual like physical hardware really locked down and not having to create a back door that the trade-off would be okay, but we can continue to subpoena and get data from iCloud, right? It's like, yeah, if you show up with a valid warrant, we will give all you all of the user stuff from iCloud to you. And so that's that's kind of been the the agreement ever since because for the most part, unless you're a really, really hardened, really um, malicious, smart criminal, you probably aren't turning everything off and running just local. Um, and so there's a treasure trove of data in iCloud that can be used to um, hopefully aid in an in investigation. Adam, you had mentioned the other feature that was announced at the same time, which was this communications safety system for children. Mm-hmm. And while it is somewhat related in the same vein of like we want to protect our children from sexually exploited material, it's 
a totally different concept than the whole CSAM scanning and client side scanning. And so just real quick, what Apple announced was that if you have a device that's set up for a child, meaning that you're using Apple iCloud families and you have a child account that's set up and then that child is using iMessages like I have for my kids. They have iPads, they have their own iCloud account and it's linked to mine as the parent. And at that point, the message app, and it's really distinct to call this out because the iMessage service, the end-to-end encryption of the service is still intact. But the iMessage app, which includes SMS and also iMessages, will notify a warning for the parent if the child device tries to send or view an image that they have received containing explicit sexual activity. Now, the detection for this is different than what we had talked about with the CSAM detection because we're not using hashes in this case. This is using computer vision or on-device machine-based learning the same way that like Photos app kind of looks at your face and says, let me find all the pictures with your face or let me find all the pictures of a car or let me find all the pictures of a cat. And so it does that with some algorithm that is machine learning to do that. And so they've tweaked the algorithm to look for sexually explicit activity. And if the photo triggers that when they're sending it or receiving it, then it it pops up a warning for the parent. And it's not being done in the photos app. It's just being done in the message app. And again, it's, it's on the device itself, not in the cloud. And this is, Apple doesn't have the hashes of these photos. It has zero knowledge of the photos and it doesn't want to know about the photos in your messages. The warning that it pops up is kind of similar to that like warning that you get when you're trying to buy something or or whatever, when a child requests more time or anything like that. And it just pops up and, and you can either approve it or not approve it. And the notifications are turned on automatically for any children under 12. And they cannot be, they're automatically turned on for children under 12 and only for children under 12. And they cannot be turned on for any children who are 13 and over. So the behavior for folks who are 13 and over is that they have to, click the photo in order to view it and if they click the photo and view it then they'll get a notification sent to the parent device so this is also kind of a concern to me mainly because this is one of the things that infosec professionals kind of fear as far as the technology goes because they're implementing a technology to scan content prior to encryption That's the fear is that in an end-to-end encrypted communication, you can't decrypt the communication because that's the point. And when it's sitting at rest, it's encrypted as well. So that's the point. But if you can capture the information prior to encryption, then you can have the content. Essentially, you have access to the content. So I think also a slippery slope. I would agree that, you know, this is stuff that is good for society that we probably should be scanning and protecting our children from this sort of stuff but it really starts to get into a little bit of the privacy of break not necessarily breaking the encryption but circumventing it and scanning the content before it's sent through iMessage in my opinion I think there's that. And, and certainly I have called that out in the past, like when we've talked about SSL decryption in the enterprise and my discomfort with that, because if you are passing that through some sort of uh, engine that is trying to look for keywords or key phrases or whatever, uh, that's something bad guys could attach to as well and look for things to float through it, like, oh, passwords, account numbers, etc. So I think that's a very attractive target where you are intentionally weakening your own security 
to potentially have your own security benefits, but it's extremely attractive. So I think from that angle is, is a good one to point out. This is not enabled by default for um, children unless parents turn it on. So that's important to note that you have to have a child account in family sharing and you have to enable it for that child account manually. So this does not, if you're an adult, this, this does not happen. This only happens if you have a child account that's on a family sharing plan and the parent has turned it on. However, I saw a different concern that I had not thought of that I, I kind of want to bring to the table in this conversation. It was uh, a Brianna Wu, who is one of the co-hosts of the fantastic rocket podcast, which is uh, three women doing a tech podcast. Um, and it's fantastic and highly recommend rocket. But anyhow, Brianna Wu had this concern that for children that are potentially transgender or are um, LGBTQ, they may be having conversations with maybe peers or, or folks to kind of learn more about themselves and their interests and their likes and dislikes. And this could potentially be used by a, a parent with regressive views to put it mildly, um, to learn about those conversations and, and those and potentially take harmful or punitive action against the child. Um, when the child is only thinking they're having a private conversation to, um, learn more about their own kind of sexual preferences and gender, um, identity and everything else. And so that is, um, something I had not considered, which is very typical of, of someone like me, uh, who, who is a, a, a white straight male. Um, it is not something I had thought of, but it is certainly extremely concerning as a, a potential harmful, um, negative use of, of this tool in a, in a really negative way. Um, obviously you hope parents would be supportive of those conversations, but we know there are parents out there in this world who are unfortunately not. And so that's not something I had thought of. And that is a, um, something to really consider about too, is well-intentioned, right? I think the intent here is strong and really, really good. And this is the perfect example, just to get on my soapbox for a split second here. When you hear leadership at your company talk about why it's so important, we have more diverse and inclusive teams, like engineering teams, like teams building technologies like this. If we had more transgendered, if we had more LGBTQ um, folks in the room, they would point out these concerns when this technology was being architected. And I, I think those concerns coming out after the announcement are indicative that possibly, I don't want to assume, um, possibly the team that built this was not diverse enough to think through all of the potential negative use cases. So I thought that was a really interesting conversation and is a perfect example of how very well-intentioned technology here um, can be used in really the wrong way, in the wrong hands. That's an excellent point and certainly something that I didn't think about either. Mm -hmm. And so for now, Apple has delayed CSAM for a couple of months to quote unquote collect input and make improvements. So more to come on this, but I thought that this was a, an interesting topic to talk about because phones are something that we use all the time. There are a lot of iPhones, a lot of iOS devices, and this technology was while not new, because they're doing client-side stuff already, but it was a new feature that got a lot of outrage, enough that they are pulling back for now and delaying it. So that's our show for this week. Thanks for joining, as always. Our contact information will be in the show notes. If you have any security topics you want us to talk about or questions on the show, thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.